Ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Faculty of Education, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's public lecture. This is the first in a series of public lectures linked to the science of learning strategic research theme. Science of learning is not only a hugely important focal area for academic research, but it's also of immense potential significance for policies and practices related to learning from infancy through to old age. And this series of public lectures, which we're proud to be presenting, aims to introduce you to some of the key advances, issues, and challenges in this exciting new area of research. Now, as well as welcoming you this afternoon and introducing this series of lectures, it's also my very great honor and privilege to introduce to you today's speakers, Professor Laura-Anne Petito and Dr. K.K. Chan. Professor Laura-Anne Petito is a world-renowned cognitive neuroscientist. She's the co-principal investigator and science director of the National Science Foundation's Science of Learning Center, Visual Language and Visual Learning, VL2, at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. She's also a professor in the Department of Psychology at Gallaudet, an affiliated professor in the Department of Psychology at Georgetown University, and the scientific director of her own brain and language laboratory for neuroimaging. Professor Petito is here with us at Hong Kong U in her capacity as Sinwai King Distinguished Visiting Professor in the Humanities. And it's a huge honor and privilege that she was able to accept the Sinwai Ping Professorship. I was very pleased when I visited Professor Petito's Gallaudet website this morning that the very first thing I saw was the name of the Distinguished Visiting Professorship and a wonderful photograph of Lauren wrapped up for the Hong Kong winter with Victoria Harbour in the background. <laughs> Professor Petito's scholarship has led to spectacular insights into sign language and the workings of the human brain. She's well known for her scientific discoveries concerning language and its neural representation in the human brain, how young children acquire language, the shared sign and spoken language processing sites and systems in the human brain, the bilingual brain, and the reading brain. Some of her earliest work involved breakthrough research studying the language capacity of chimpanzees, working with the chimpanzee known as Nim Chimpsky. If you're unfamiliar with those studies, do go onto YouTube later because <laughs> there's lots of things about the studies there and they're absolutely fascinating. Professor Petito is particularly known more recently for her role in the creation of the new discipline, Educational Neuroscience. And she's one of the co-founders of the PhD in Educational Neuroscience at Gallaudet University. Educational Neuroscience, as Professor Petito will no doubt explain in her talk, involves the marriage of basic scientific discoveries about the developing brain and child with their principled application to solving core problems in the education of young children. It's therefore research that is of particular relevance and interest to those of us involved in educational practice, as well as to all of us who are parents and grandparents. Professor Petito has received more than 20 international prizes and awards for her distinguished scientific achievements, including being elected in 2008 as a fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Association for Psychological Science. In 1998, she received a Guggenheim Award for, and I quote, her unusually distinguished achievements in the past and exceptional promise for future accomplishment in the discipline of neuroscience. And there's absolutely no doubt that she's fulfilled that exceptional promise in the years since that award. I first had the pleasure of meeting Professor Petito just a couple of weeks ago. And during that time, what has particularly struck me in addition to the qualities of scholarship that you would expect of someone with the achievements I've just described, is Professor Petito's passion. Her passion not only for research and the pursuit of knowledge, but also her passion for seeking ways of translating the findings of her research into practice so that it can help to improve the lives of learners of all ages. The title of her talk this afternoon, Science of Learning, Why It Matters to Schools and Families, illustrates precisely this point. I've been equally struck 
by Professor Petito's passionate eloquence as a communicator. So I'm sure that we can look forward to a truly memorable and inspiring talk this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Professor Petito. I'm also delighted to introduce our other special guest this afternoon, Dr. K.K. Chan, who will be responding to Professor Petito's talk and taking part in the Q&A session. Dr. Chan is Deputy Secretary for Education, and before that, she was Chief Executive of the Curriculum Development Institute, a post she took up in 1998. In those roles, she's been instrumental in shaping the development and implementation of Hong Kong's radical reform of the entire school curriculum. I know KK won't mind me saying that she's very much one of us. She's an alumna of the faculty, a former colleague, and a very good friend. So it's always an enormous pleasure to welcome her back to Hong Kong U, and in particular to the Faculty of Education. Dr. Chan's various roles in shaping education policy and practice in leading curriculum reform and in helping to mould language policy in Hong Kong, make her the ideal person to respond to Professor Petito's talk this afternoon. So could I please ask you to join me in welcoming Dr Chan as well. <laughs> now this afternoon's session will be organised as follows. First, I will invite Professor Petito to speak to us. At the end of her talk, I will immediately ask Dr. Chan to respond, and then you'll see that there are some seats in the middle of the stage. We will then move to those seats and we'll invite you to engage Professor Petito and Dr. Chan in a Q&A session. So without further ado, let me invite Professor Laura Ann Petito to speak to us. Thank you, Dean Andrews, for that wonderful introduction. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be before you all. Thank you for coming out on, your, on a beautiful Saturday in your gorgeous city of Hong Kong. I'm really appreciative and, and just delighted to be here. I'm especially delighted to speak before Dr. K.K. Chan. Thank you, Dean Stephen Andrews. And I'm especially thankful for Nancy, Professor Nancy Law for inviting me here to assume this wonderful honor of the Sun Wai Kim Distinguished Visiting Professorship in the Humanities. I also thank my colleagues in the Faculty of Education, my newly met colleagues, and my colleagues in the Humanities. Thank you all for being here. Today I'm going to uh, talk to you from my uh, perspective and role and knowledge as a cognitive neuroscientist, as Professor Andrews, Dean Andrews mentioned. Um, I'm a um, uh, at Gallaudet University, and I uh, have a passionate interest for decades in the neuroplasticity of the human brain. I'm especially interested in how the environment, how our culture, oops, there's a hole in the floor, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I just discovered it. How our environment impacts us, how <laughs> our um, uh, growing up experiences can actually change our brain and actually how learning and learning in schools change our brain. In that pursuit, I've asked, uh, used methods that entail neuroimaging and behavioral work. And I've also made contributions to our knowledge of the learning brain, the language learning brain, the language, uh, the reading brain, and the bilingual brain. Today I'll try to share with you some of my insights from the bilingual brain. My plan will first be, we'll talk about what is the science of learning? What is it? Then I will provide an example that hopefully will give you uh, insights in the nature of the discoveries towards the resolution of some of the myths that, and common beliefs that we have about early bilingual exposure. And ultimately, my goal will be to explain how these myths are myths, so actually incorrect. And I will end with an, uh, insights into how is it that this, the science of learning matters and how can we contribute to this knowledge to improving education. Okay. Um, so we live in a changing world. Uh, the world our children are in 
are, is going to change even from now until their adulthood. The knowledge that our children will learn that's going to be new and discoveries haven't even been discovered yet. So how could we prepare them best for this future world? We know we can't provide them with every possible outcome of knowledge because that knowledge isn't discovered. So we have a problem. And this is a problem that has really uh, concerned learning scientists and the science of learning scientists for uh, over a decade. How can we resolve this problem? The solution will be to actually study how humans learn. Given that we can't account for all the eventualities of knowledge that a child's going to have, we can understand how children learn. What is the optimal periods of learning? When to expose children to knowledge at peak periods in their development? What happens if a child doesn't have the perfect environment and passes core sensitive periods of human language uh, and human social and emotional development? How forgiving is Mother Nature? How much can we come in and remediate and improve our child to give them the best chances to come? Here's where the science of learning enters. It's one of the major solutions that we've been able to offer in the last decade. The science of learning entails exciting discoveries about just that, how children learn, how we learn across the lifespan, what happens to the aging brain? How can we protect the aging brain to keep it as active and vibrant as it was when we were younger? So these are the types of things that we focus on in the science of learning. The science of learning, as I said, is interested in learning across the lifespan. It is, by definition, a multidisciplinary team. Why is it multidisciplinary? Well, it turns out that when we have any kind of complex target phenomenon, it requires complex groups of experts to come together to crack the code. So it is necessarily a multidisciplinary endeavor. We look at how and when and what children learn, and as I said, how best to facilitate the course of learning across the lifespan. Now, a subgroup of people in the science of learning are actually interested in the core problems of learning, as it says here, learning in early life. So where a science of learning spans learning across the lifespan, a subset of people within this general discipline are passionately interested in learning in early life. And here, it's been called educational neuroscience. And educational neuroscience is interested in the what, the how, the when children learn, and particularly in the issue of timing. What are the optimal times in early child development during which they must experience core knowledge in their environment? The field has within it five focal points of research. One has to do with language and bilingualism. One is math and numeracy, all in early life. One is science and critical thinking, social, emotional, and moral development, and reading and literacy. And as I mentioned, all of this is brought to bear in the commitment to the translation of this information towards resolving core problems in education today. So when, what were the historical foundation roots of this science of learning? We're um, uh, very lucky in the United States to have Dr. Susan Ling. She's in the highest, uh, one of the highest positions at the National Science Foundation. She spearheaded this about 10 years ago bringing together core groups of people in the United States. She established six science of learning centers in the United States. You're very lucky because next week she's actually coming here to speak. It's very thrilling for me because essentially she's my boss. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm really thrilled to have an opportunity to like, be in the same building with her and get to talk to her because at the National Science Foundation she's a very busy woman. Um, but she spearheaded this, this, this creation of these centers to focus 
on solving the problem of how humans learn. Now, the other factor is that since she began this 10 years ago and brought these groups of people together, this has become a revolutionary movement around the world. The science of learning and also educational neuroscience, its, it's, it's daughter discipline, has been springing up in departments and universities all over. So for example, uh, there's um, a new program in the science of learning and educational neuroscience at Stanford University, at Vanderbilt University, at Harvard University, Johns Hopkins, at Gallaudet University. In England, there's passionate interest in this at uh, University College London, Cambridge University, Birkbeck, all have uh, PhD programs in educational neuroscience slash the science of learning. There's serious interest in East China University, in um, uh, Shanghai University, also in Beijing. The NSF uh, uh, person uh, is, will be here next week as well. And uh, there's interest in the Beijing region. And of course, there's passionate interest here at the University of Hong Kong. And I'll return to that in a moment. Not only is there interest and are there departments, but there's funding that's being made available at the level of nations. There's funding that's being made available at, at the international level with the OECD and the United Nations. There's also just worldwide international interest. Um, just to by way of uh, two examples, um, in 2004, um, Pope John Paul II uh, invited me and the, three co the two other co-founders of the discipline, Kurt Fisher at Harvard and Ushika Shwami in Cambridge, invited us to be, this wasn't religious, this was entirely scientific, to speak before the Pontifical so Society and to discuss this new discipline, educational neuroscience. The uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences had identified two disciplines that they thought were those to be watched for the next hundred years as being the optimal union of science and society. One of them was stem cell research and the second one was educational neuroscience. So we're very excited about that. And then just recently in December, I was invited to the White House to discuss the exciting, fruitful union between neuroscience and education, science of learning and educational neuroscience, and there will be a workshop this year in 2015 uh, sponsored at the White House on educational neuroscience and the science of learning. So these are very exciting movements that are happening worldwide. But you don't have to go uh, to out to the world. One of the um, uh, reasons I'm here is because of the thrilling accomplishments and advancements that are going on right now here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, it began in 2000 with Kai Ming uh, Chan, his uh, ad, um, first uh, launching of an initiative in the science of learning. But since then, uh, pioneered by these four co-conveners, uh, Professor Nancy Law, Brendan Weeks, Bradley McPherson, and Carol Chan, there's been a strategic research theme on the science of learning with much more growth to come. And it has the enthusiastic support of the Dean, Dean uh, Stephen Andrews. So this is a very exciting time here in Hong Kong. This really does prove to be a pioneering context to make the University of Hong Kong a hub a regional hub a world war on the world stage in the science of learning. It's a very exciting time here. So, one of the, so I will now turn to providing an example of how the science of learning and discoveries in the science of learning can be bridged and translated to have meaningful, in, in, meaningful input into education and educational policy. And also those of you who are parents in the room today. It's very important because you are a very important source of our knowledge and the source of the types of questions and research that we ask. One of the things I didn't mention is that the science of learning is committed not just to basic science, but and not just to translation, but to two-way communication between the, the parents, the community, the educators, and the lab. And vice versa. This isn't the great scientists informing the community, no. This is a two-way partnership. 
The discussions with you help us understand what we have to know and what we have to study and vice versa. So it's a very exciting union and I hope in the discussion period we can uh, get into a conversation about the priorities and concerns that are important to you, those of you in this room. So I'll start with an example taken from language. Why language? Lang well, language because I love it, uh, because it was my passion since I'm about age 11. Um, I wanted to understand how it is that we know how does information from the outside world get into our heads. Well, one of the primary, there's many ways in which the world outside gets into our head. We touch, we smell, uh, there are a variety of ways. But one of the really cool ways, the extraordinary ways is human language. It's one of the primary ways in which I encode thought, in which I communicate my, my emotions, my thoughts to you and you to me. It also is um, a political hotbed. Wars are fought over language. Cultures are defined by language. Boundaries and communities are defined by language. So language is very central. And one of the things that's fascinated me, given that language is so central, and given that uh, we're such a, um, a mobile, moving world, is that many of us are in contexts that require we speak multiple languages. And here's where I've been very fascinated. As much as we know multiple languages are important, it has remained a controversial issue. It has remained a paradoxical issue. And uh, bilingualism has remained the most emotional and uh, fraught with myths and common beliefs. And it's, it's at many levels. So I'm going to say right now, here's my goal for today. I would like to talk about the myths about bilingual education. I'd like to show how they are myths. They're myths, meaning they're wrong. And that um, the discoveries have shown that these everyday beliefs really have to be reevaluated if we want to improve education for our children and the education for our children to come. Okay, so um, these paradoxical views are at many levels of society, our communities, our culture. Um, they're at the level of countries, governments, scientists, and parents. And let me, ex let me em emphasize, it really is at the level of scientists. There are camps and raging wars within the, uh, sci among scientists about uh, bilingualism. And interestingly, it incorporates the views from the public. They're not, they're not uh, hermetically sealed or immune from common beliefs. So uh, you'll see some of them as we pr pr proceed. Um, uh, and these, uh, at the level of countries, are daily occurrence. Yesterday I read, it, just yesterday in an Italian newspaper, there was a huge article um, with the grand dilemma of whether or not the Italian government should support children in Italy learning the dialects of the uh, people. Uh, um, questioning whether dialects uh, would interfere or contaminate the child's acquisition of Italian. You know well the language laws and language police in the province of Quebec, in Canada, uh, the United States and Spanish and English. Um, you know well the Hong Kong context with multiple languages that are evaluated and how best to introduce a child to them and when. So this is really, these are real problems at the level of the world and governments, parents and scientists. Okay. So what are some of these common views that we'll take a look at today? Uh, one is that um, children who are exposed to two languages too early in life are language delayed. Another is that there, the two languages, if it's too early in life, will cause language confusion. Another is that early exposure is bad. Um, here, children should learn the mother tongue first is another belief. Another one is parents must speak perfectly the target language before speaking to their child. And in the discussion period, I hope you tell me some of those that you've also heard of. So because there are many, and these are just a touch, the tip of the iceberg. So how as scientists, how within um, the co scientific community can we test these, these views? It's very important because we, we seek evidence-based knowledge to make policy change. So where do you begin? These are very complex claims. These are very strong attributions. 
They have to do with the whole of us, our language, our culture. How do we begin to test these? So let's begin by how we begin in science. We look at the underlying assumptions, the propositions that underlie the claims, and then we try to address each one. So here we have, if bilingualism is somehow harmful, it implies the logical implication is that monolingual is somehow normal. In order for that to be the case, the human body, the human biology would have to be, have been evolved to be monolingual. And that somehow if you're exposed to multiple languages, that this is a kind of neural trauma. So we should see indices of this neural trauma in development over time. But let me go on. So one implication is if bilingualism is harmful, monolingual is uh, normal. And the question is, is early bilingual development abnormal? That's just a logical question. If, if no monolingual is normal, then is bilingualism abnormal? So let's look at that. We're going to look at it with two methods. One is going to be predominantly behavioral evidence. And that's going to draw heavily on timing, a maturational timing and development. And the second set of evidence that we'll consider is the brain. And I'll also take a moment to explain how is it that the brain adds this new information, information that we couldn't know just from the behavioral data. And that's a very important part when you're committed to the science of learning and educational neuroscience, bringing neuroscience findings into their applicability in education. And just as a moment, let me just explain why is timing so important in development? It turns out that whenever we see something in the maturation of a child that's persistent across wide varieties of contexts, despite cultural differences and environmental vagaries, whenever we see these persistent patterns nonetheless rear their head and push out into human development, we immediately suspect that aspects of that are under biological and genetic control. So we're very fascinated in development to see what are those persistent patterns that push themselves out onto development despite wildly varying environments. That tells us that something about that is part of the species and important and going to be true of all children. So let's start with the first one. Here, um, in order to begin, we need to understand what are the normal maturational milestones in the development of monolingual children who are just getting one language. Well, it turns out that no matter what language you're learning, whether it's Chinese with a tonal structure or um, uh, English with a highly uh, syntactic focused relatively stripped down morphology, uh, whether the, what I'm trying to express is whether irrespective of the topological surface differences of language structure and syntax, the species, no matter where you were born in life, goes through these early stages of language acquisition on the same maturational timetable. So normal, typically developing children by six months have begun to produce their babbling. By 12 months, typically developing children hit their first word milestone. By 18 months, most children who are typically developing hit, have hit their first two word milestone. At 24 months, they begin morphologically embellishing their language. They begin more complex syntax. They also uh, are all through development, not just at uh, 24 months. Uh, really all through early development, children's semantic conceptual development is marching forward. This is not serial. Our development is really marching in parallel, collaterally. Um, and then actually quite early comes in pragmatic and discourse. Uh, indices and knowledge of conversational structure and how to use language. It's very interesting. Children learn very early and express very early manipulation of their environment through language even well before they have complex syntax. So um, uh, these are the typical developments. So what do we see? In, so now the question is, if this is normal, what about bilingual children? If bilingual children have an atypical development, then we should see 
a different pattern. And instead what we see is that bilingual children achieve each and every milestone on the identical timetable as, as a monolingual child and also on the same timetable as their other language. Now I want to emphasize, you might say, well, no, my child uh, speaks um, Chinese more than they speak English. Those are uh, sociolinguistic vagaries that are impacted by language exposure, frequency of input. You can have a child who's home all day with uh, Chinese mom having more vocabulary words in Chinese and less in the English language that's being inputted to them. But you won't have a child have, uh, in these milestones, all children will hit the milestones on the same, within the same maturational period. And nor can you drill a child to skip over them. So if a child's at six months and you really want your child to speak two word utterances, you can't drill them to get them to the 18 month stage. These are biologically governed, yeah, you can't do that, so don't try. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, although we really do try, um, uh, we've, it's, it's, maturation will have its much longer its, um, uh, dutiful course. So this is true of uh, world languages. And these are one of the exciting maturational timing regularities that we see in human development. Um, and this is the identical type of timing regularity that we see in the bilingual child. So we immediately can set aside one thing. Bilingual language acquisition is not abnormal. Not abnormal from a biological perspective. Just to give you a sense of how uh, powerful these maturational, um, pro this maturational progression is. I'm going to show you just a brief clip of a very unusual type of bilingual child. This is a child who's hearing, entirely normal hearing, but in a hearing and deaf home, or in a, a home where the father's hard of hearing and, and speaks to the child, and the child is, the child's mother is deaf and going to sign to the child. So remember, we typically think of bilingualism as two spoken languages. It's such a dramatic regularity in development that even if I change the modality and I give the child spoken and sign language, the children achieve each and every milestone. Now I can't show you the child's whole development, but it's a nice little clip that identifies this phenomenon. Now there's a voice here. Okay, I'll, I'll just start that again. Okay, here we go. It's very short, a couple of seconds. Simone is almost two years old. He's signing. And he's speaking. His mother is profoundly deaf and signs to him. His father is partially deaf and speaks to him in French. Simone, who has normal hearing, seems perfectly comfortable with this arrangement. So this child didn't turn away from sign input. There was no timing. You know, if speech were special or if speech were privileged, the child should have turned away from the sign input gleaning any morsel of uh, sound it could possibly get. Instead, it's time locked. These children hit every single milestone on the identical timetable, just as if they were learning Chinese and English, French and Spanish, French and English, whatever combination you can ask. So um, then turning to the semantic development, these children who are getting, or children who are exposed to two languages early in life are not confused. They r develop in rich semantic and conceptual underpinnings of language uh, and language vocabulary and language uh, use um, uh, equally. Um, these are some of the references. I can um, certainly make these all available to you. And we also note that these children are not confused. Um, often we see that the children mix their languages and that's entirely normal and that's entirely healthy. 
children's mixing is not reflecting a biological confusion with the languages. Instead, it's in reflecting the amount of mixing that their env environment gives them. So if you have high mixing parents, you'll have a high mixing child. If you have a low mixing parent, you'll have low mixing children. But the children are not impaired or confused. And we have a lot of indices that make that true. Um, we could talk more about that. So in the first generation of bilingual studies, we discovered that the child's early acquisition of language, a bilingual, is strong and good and not abnormal. And we could set that hypothesis and set that myth aside, but now we get to school. And there was a return. So in the history of bilingualism and the studies, there's a return of the prejudices, the myths, again. Now the myths are don't allow the child to be exposed to the two languages in the school day because this will confuse the child, make the child a jack of all trades, an ace of none. It will reduce the amount of time the child's in one language or the other. Two reading systems were thought to be disastrous for a developing child, to confuse the child, that the child wouldn't be able to pull them apart. So let's take a look at some of these uh, uh, myths. Reading and literature in two languages too early produces, was thought to produce disadvantages. And so how will we, could, here's some of the hypotheses and how we'll test it. So the hypothesis, as I alluded to a moment ago, has to do with time on task and interference. The idea was inspired from learning theory, embraced within psychology and education, that there would be a competition of the two languages, that somehow they would contaminate each other, that there'd be less time on task, less time in Chinese or less time in English, that the child has to be protected from this potential source of contamination and allowed to establish one language first and securely, and then when it's safe, the child can be introduced to the new ho host language. In turn, this theory implied that a separation in, edu in educational part is very strong in the United States. We call this the hold back policy. It is the premier policy the primary policy of the United States. The separation in time is best to learn to read first in L1, then when it's safe, in L2, followed in time by L2. And this is an example of where our evidence from the neurosciences is going to teach us that this educational policy flies in the face of human biology. We are hurting our children instead of helping our children. So let's just quickly review some of the evidence. Um, so the age of first bilingual or new language exposure. Uh, these are um, many studies, but I'm just going to summarize one. Uh, how can we test the notion of time on task? Well, here's one way, behaviorally. You look at children who are exposed to two languages from birth. So now they're going to have a really split time on task. But what about children who are exposed to one language, they're monolingual, until age three? And at age three, for the first time, they get exposed to two languages, two or multiple languages. Age five, they're monolingual to age five, and then they get exposed to two or multiple languages. They're monolingual to age seven to nine, and then at age seven to nine, they get exposed to multiple languages, and so on and so forth. Now the reason we picked these ages is because they correspond to major periods of brain myelinization, brain change, and we were looking at whether or not there was this interaction between the environment and the age at which a child was first exposed. Now what's the prediction here? If we're going on the prediction from learning theory, education, and uh, psychology, the prediction is that the children who had the least time on task should perform the worst, that's the children at birth, but these children who were able to be monolingual up to age three, five, and seven, and uh, nine, we should see these children show stronger language capacities. They get their foundation in one language and then they get the introduction of the new language. We also compared whether these children, how these children were learning. Were they learning in home, in sense of community, or classroom? 
And what we found, oh, oh, there's one other thing I want to tell you. Okay, so, and there were 15 language pairs, including Chinese and English. These are, this is just one reference there, but these are large studies and many of them. The result is that the earlier the child was exposed to two languages, these earlier groups by birth, by age three, and by age five, the earlier the child was exposed to two languages, the stronger they were in each of their two languages. So that's contrary to the prediction. The data did not support the claim that the children had to have one language first until it's safe and then the introduction of another language. Now there was a surprise pro finding here. Um, the earlier is better. It's called age of exposure, AOE. So this tells us that the human brain is contributing to this equation. Before we were only looking at behavioral data, now we have the first index that the human brain is contributing something significant, but how are we gonna study it? And I'll show you how in a moment. But there was an exciting finding in all the group of studies, and that is that not all of these contexts were equally potent and equally powerful to give the child that bilingual strength and bilingual advantage. So, for example, the classroom only children, children who were exposed to a new language only in the context of instructional, uh, instructional con context, like just a classroom, did not fare as well as children who had home and intensive community exposure. This was very exciting. This was very uplifting. Children don't have the perfect home, the perfect background. What happens to the child who's in one language context at home and then they show up at school and they're speaking another language in the school? Are these children doomed because they didn't have early exposure? No, these children did fine if they had intensive home and intensive community contribution to this learning of a new language. They didn't do well if they just got the periods of you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for one hour. All right, so that was exciting because what it taught us is that home and intensive community are really the best tools we can use for children with various language backgrounds if our target is to make them optimal users. And also that cu culture is contributing to this. Culture around the child can lessen the impact of later language exposure. It was a very exciting set of findings. So now I'm going to turn briefly, given that these early findings suggested that the human brain was involved, we now set to understand how is the brain involved and how can we test it. Okay. I'm, I don't think I mentioned I'm, I'm summarizing um, 30 years of research, so that's why it, it, it's being compressed. So, all right, so how do, why would the brain give us any information? Why do, why, why would that enlighten us, especially with regard to educational policy and the types of things that parents might want to do at home? For one thing, and this is a really important point in science, the behavioral data that we were seeing were equally supporting the competing models, the competing hypotheses. There was no way to finally adjudicate between which theory was right and which theory was wrong, which practice in a school was best and which practice in the school was not optimal because researchers were doing studies that came in behaviorally supporting each one depending on you how you ask the question and analyze the data. So the brain studies permit us to test hypotheses, to track the developmental time. If someone says that a child has a taxing problem with uh, bilingualism and it's computationally difficult, well, that implies heavy frontal lobe involvement. Well, we can look in the brain and when we see, my goodness, the child's not engaging more frontal lobe. Instead, they're engaging more language tissue, which is foreshadowing what's going to turn out. But it allowed us, adding the brain to the equation allowed us to really advance in our understanding of what type of knowledge is involved in early bilingual, bilingualism, what type of computations are involved, when in development, and again, that biological index, when is it optimal to expose a child to two languages? Our behavioral data suggested early. 
What about brain development? Does that support or refute that suspicion that early is best? So we'll take a, a, a look and um, to do this, um, no scientist uh, can progress without their uh, telescope. Uh, Galileo needed his telescope. Um, uh, scientists need their microscope. So there really is a marriage between uh, scientific breakthrough and discoveries and the advance of our technology. And um, uh, uh, as many of you have seen this um, um, uh, functional magnetic imaging uh, system, uh, which is on your left, the M uh, fMRI, uh, medically you might have experienced it, or as an experiment you might have experiment, exper experienced it. And what are the things that is common of this? What happens when you're in it? Can you move around? No, you're strapped down and you get rolled into a donut, the donut hole. <laughs> and also, it's making loud pings and pops and it's vibrating. And if you're doing language studies, you have competition in the auditory cortex with the pings and the pops. Also, you can't talk, you can't gesture, you can't write or read, you can't put a young child in this, it's prohibited. So what's exciting is that there's the advent of this new technology, really quite revolutionary. It's the functional near-infrared spectroscopy system. It, it has many advantages, very briefly. Children, infants can sit on mom's lap, they can move around. We can take this system and we can put it on specific swatches of brain tissue and systems of tissue and we can track it over time. We can see a child who's at risk for language delay and disorder even before they start babbling. We can s track specific development of tissue over time. It's very exciting. This is a, uh, it also has many advantages over the fMRI. The children can move. It has excellent uh, uh, spatial and temporal resolution. It has superior temporal resolution than an fMRI. Let me, I'll just leave you with uh, the fMRI samples at um, w uh, uh, two times every, uh, once every other second, sorry, uh, uh, two times every other second. This samples 10 times a second. So it's a faster measure of neuronal activity than the fMRI. And one of the exciting things is that your own uh, Hong Kong University is, uh, um, will is pursuing the um, buying of this uh, equipment. It's very exciting. So um, let's just uh, test the common view that somehow the bilingual brain is deviant. This, remember the system, you can put children on a mom's lap. They, infants, uh, for the first time in history. You cannot put an infant in an fMRI unless it's preoperative and at risk of dying. Okay, so um, uh, the, we will test the hypothesis that the bilingual brain is deviant, monolingual is normal, and then we should see privileged neuro neural status in the uh, monolingual brain and something different or discrete about a bilingual child's brain. So we're gonna, I'm going to give you uh, very briefly three types of punchlines, one from infancy, one from children, and one from adults. And then we'll look at the educational implications. So first, we compared bilingual children's brains with infants, 14 months old, with monolingual <coughs> infants' brains. And if the bilingual child was deviant, we should expect different engagement of neural tissue when a bilingual versus a monolingual is processing spoken language. So on the left side, we see monolinguals who are 14 months old. And on the right side, we see bilingual infants who are 14 months old. And one of the things that's very exciting here is that, um, uh, let me see, if I look this way, my left hemisphere, this tissue right here, it's the superior temple gyrus, and that's the tissue that's al actually allowing you to understand me now. It's the tissue that uh, I, I'm speaking, there's a very fast swish of sound hitting your ear, and it's the tissue that pulls out the rhythmic undulating segments that make, that let you find the phonology so that you can look up the meanings of words. And this is a very uncontroversial um, function that this brain tissue does. And so this is your superior temple gyrus. This is the tissue that allows you to hear different phonetic units. 
and we have a, a bilingual child who's listening also to phonetic syllabic units. And we see, uh, we know from our uh, mathematical computations that the tissue is identical. We don't, there's no deviance in the bilingual brain. But note, one of the things you see is that the bilingual child, even at 14 months old, is using the greater extent and variability of the neural tissue that nature gave us. They have a, a more massaged, plump language tissue. So rather, it's almost as if the uh, monolingual brain's on a diet. And the bilingual brain, already at 14 months, is using more of the neural tissue. I should say that these structural brain changes are associated with advantaged functional changes. So these children have a greater capacity, more open capacity to discriminate the speech sounds that they've never been exposed to. And that capacity stays open longer in life and we see that capacity also aids the bilingual child. It's the mechanism that makes possible why we discover that the bilingual child's children are better readers. Because this advanced plumped up language phonological processing is now going to be applied when they're early readers. And so they are advantaged readers relative to the monolingual child. Uh, uh, apropos of that point, I'll just summarize the studies from the children's brains. Uh, early and simultaneous multiple language exposure within the same developmental period is best. And let me just explain. Obviously, you can't speak two languages to a child at the same time because that would be very unhealthy. But if you <laughs> use two languages at the s within the same developmental period, it's called simultaneous. If you do that to children, that they get, that is optimal for the child's development because it affords them language strengths, language processing strengths, and the surprise is in each of their languages, so rather than weakening one language and strengthening another, they're getting strengths in both their languages or their multiple languages, and the m strengths in the neural tissue have concomitant behavioral impact. They're better readers than the age-matched monolingual uh, children. This next finding is very exciting, and again, I'll just try to briefly explain it. Um, <coughs> Uh, and this, uh, it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around this. These are, if you have, we, ha we studied monolingual children in the United States who were from very, very poor backgrounds. This is socioeconomic, they're considered low socioeconomic status. Very, very poor children who buy, and we know in the United States that um, uh, under-resourced children have, a, uh, it has a deleterious effect impact on their academic achievement and these are these can be lifelong it's these are these really because of the brain development and early exposure these can be deleterious we studied children who were identified as uh, having low SES for homes and these children by accident of their neighborhood were sent to bilingual Spanish English schools they were fully simultaneous in that it was two languages given to the children at the same developmental period. And these children were tested on their reading, writing, language, higher cognitive and intelligence measures, very extensive measures. And what we found, we compared these children to monolingual children from the highest SES in the United States. So you have low SES, SES children who are, by virtue of their background, their home and neighborhood are in bilingual schools. And you have high SES children who are just monolingual, but they're from the highest SES in the United States. Monolingual from very privileged backgrounds with all the advantages one would expect. The bilingual children the children who were from monolingual homes by accident of their neighborhood were educated in bilingual schools outperformed the children who were monolingual from the highest SES of the United States. This has been replicated. It is now on the U.S. Department of Education's website. 
it's, it's suggesting that bilingual school, early bilingual schooling is so powerful that it potentially has the power to ameliorate the impact of low SES on the developing child. So this is very exciting findings um, and there, uh, uh, as I said, uh, many of them. So let me turn very, I'll just take another moment and then uh, we'll get to uh, quickly the educational implications. Bilingual brains are taxed. Somehow, the another view in the brain literature is another view in the popular literature, a common myth, is that bilingual are somehow taxed. Com what that means is that if you're a bilingual, you have a harder job than a monolingual. You have to process more, you're switching from language to language, you have to inhibit one, you have to uh, attend to another, and that this incredible uh, switching back and forth is a burden for the bilingual. So let's just t test this a moment. So this, uh, it, let me just uh, give you um, what that prediction would be. So here is again your left hemisphere. Um, uh, this is the left hemisphere if I was facing this way. And uh, this view, the, the notion that a bilingual person has a tougher job than the monolingual entails that the um, bilingual should show more right hem sorry more right hemisphere and more frontal lobe involvement. Why the frontal lobe? Because the frontal lobe is where we do complex co higher cognitive computations. So you would expect that bilingual and monolingual brains would differ if the frontal uh, if uh, the frontal lobe was having a tougher time. Now the temporal lobes is where we process language. So you would not predict that the, you would see a difference here because uh, really the prediction in the field was that bilingual frontal lobes would be recruited. Let me just point out this is an example of where bilingualism and neural studies provided really revolutionary insight into the bilingual brain that we couldn't know from behavioral studies. So the prediction is bilinguals are confused, um, uh, that have a, sorry, a higher taxed computational demands. We should see more of the um, involvement of the frontal lobe. When we compare monolingual and bilingual brains on equal tasks, we do not find that. We find that bilinguals and monolingual brains do not, none of them have increased frontal lobe activity. Instead, the bilingual has the identical neural activity in the left hemisphere for the classic tissue of processing language, but they have more of it. That's very exciting. What it means is that the bilingual brains are, it's almost like building a muscle. The language tissue is exercised, as this uh, image is trying to suggest. The bilingual, the brain studies have laid to rest myths about the bilingual brain being more computationally taxed and somehow uh, deep, different or deviant than the monolingual brain. So we can now close with what does this tell us about some of the myths that we saw in the beginning? Uh, bi early bilingual exposure is not uh, does not produce a child who's delayed. Uh, an early bilingual exposure does not produce children who are language confused. Early exposure to two languages is optimal. As early as possible is optimal. It's not true that children should uh, only be exposed to their mother tongue first and then when it's safe, later exposed to the other language. It's not true that parents have to be perfect speakers of the target language in their community before they can dare to speak to their children because so the fear of somehow they'll harm their children. This isn't true and I hope we get a chance to discuss this more in the discussion period. I can explain biologically why this is so. I'll just tell you quickly, the human brain is not interested in how much you give it. It's interested in the presence of the stimulus. It's interested in the experience with the language, even if it's imperfect, because our species goes beyond the input, systematizes the input, and it fills in grammatical problems. So 
what in, from educational neuroscience and the science of learning, what are some of the, what's a formula for success in the early exposure of two languages, multiple languages, three languages to a young developing child? Number one, the biology, this neuroscience, the science of learning, the discipline of the science of learning has told us unequivocally that the earliest exposure possible to two multiple languages, two, three languages, is absolutely best. It's optimal. That system two, systematic, regular interactions in the with the language, with regular users, is optimal. That doesn't mean you can't switch or you can't mix the languages. Mixing is okay. It's that the child has to have experience with a regular language user. The, that language user can switch between the languages, but they have to have native experience with a regular language user. Number three, the experience with language must be across multiple contexts. They can't only get a language from a classroom Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 9 to 5, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday all morning. They need to have community involvement, social involvement. Culture is important. Number three, learn from the learning scientists. Hug your professors at the University, the University of Hong Kong. Make friends with the science of learning uh, experts at the University of Hong Kong. In learning and curricula for learning has to be informed by the science of learning. That means learning, when you impart learning to a child in context, it has to be richly varied. Rote learning is fine. Children do need experience with the basics. But learning has to be fun, games, play. Expand your curriculum for exposing the child to multiple languages. And here's a really important point. The children have to be, ex actually there's a, another point I want to emphasize. When you impart multiple languages to children, the children have to experience that with equality. That's number five. Sorry, I skipped over that. Equality is very important. Children are intensely, keenly sensitive to social class, kinship, groups, familial organization. If they perceive that the one of the languages you're giving them has low status and another one has high status, they will turn from that language. No matter how enthusiastically you teach them, no matter how many, you count out seven books in this language and seven books in that language, you have to present these children with equal equality, equal respect of all languages involved. Children pick it up very early. Between two and three years old, a child sets their language preference. This is in when they have multiple exposures at the same time. They pick up, they glean social prejudice, group inclusion. You have to present the languages equally. And a vital component, another magic bullet, actually a real magic bullet, is if you have a target language, you get other children who are monolingual speakers of that target language and you have your child interact with it. It's not enough to have a play group where your goal is for the child to, to speak Spanish, but they're really from English homes and they're going to switch into English the moment you're not looking. Okay? So you, um, and this has an evolutionary reason and a biological foundation and we can talk about that in the discussion. So why have these myths persisted? We've been wrong before. They have persisted because they, not for biological reasons, but social beliefs. Our brain doesn't make us have these notions, but our mind does. And it's up to us to challenge these notions. Why have these myths persisted? It shows us the importance of the science of learning and its commitment to translation this is really key. We have to embrace this knowledge that we know. <coughs> Why have the myths persisted? We have to have more information that's needed to educators and doctors and clinicians. And we also have to bring parents in and have them stakeholders and participate in this science of learning knowledge. 
some of the programs we have is to bring teachers into our neuroscience laboratories, but more importantly, to bring parents in and have them run experiments with us, that two-way communication. Some of the policy implications are that um, educational policy makers in hearing these uh, discoveries would, be, would really be advantageous to encourage early, simultaneous, bilingual or multilingual home and school programs that are uh, provided to the children equally and have equal expectations for, for proficiency. Early <coughs> bilingual language exposure is in reading is optimal. Multiple reading systems, it's actually like if you take a magnet and you place the two end like ends together, what happens? They pull apart even stronger. <coughs> the human brain, when it gets early patterns of language, has this tissue that runs off automatically and says, oh, patterns, that pattern's associated with language one, language two, language three. And it sets up stronger neural representations for the distinct languages. Rather than weaker, it makes it stronger. When we wait and we hold the child to one language for a long period of time, then we introduce another language, that's when we get into neural interference. That's when we get more hemisphere, um, <coughs> less of the classic language tissue involvement and more of the distributed involvement. That's when we see frontal lobe. That's when we see right hemisphere involvement. It doesn't mean you can't learn the language, the question here has to do with optimality. What are the optimal ways versus ways that we can kind of chug along and get there? But if we, we all want our children to be the very best, we would um, optimally have early exposure. Another feature is um, provide rich learning context informed by the science of learning. As I said, hug your University of Hong Kong professors. Um, uh, require that research findings are available to parents, to m medical teachers and policy makers. So recapping today's one minute wrap, oh, so, um, no confusion uh, here. <coughs> I wanted to sum up one minute. Um, and the good uh, is this is the last slide. And um, I'll leave you with this. It's like 20 seconds, something like that. So this is just, uh, I, I found it accidentally on the um, internet last night. And it was almost as if I said it. And I thought, it was, if you hear it from somebody else and you hear it from me, you know, through converging evidence, um, we sometimes take notes. So here you go. So recapping today's one minute wrap, no confusion here. Bilingual brains rock with the best of them. And the good news is bilingual homes can give their kids an extra language and a brain boost without spending a penny. Even monolingual homes can reap the same rewards by investing in their children's language education from an early age. So I thank you very much. Um, this is my team of students. Thank you very much. That side. I'm also very happy to make this available, this um, lecture, for people to look at it. And um, just as a, these are some of the websites and references. Um, these are the references that I used in today's uh, discussion. Um, these are my publications. Uh, there's some resources for parents, and um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very, very much, Professor Petito. I hope we ensured you against falling through the stage of yes. the Raison Huang <laughs> Theatre. That's something we need to look into. Let me invite Professor uh, Dr. K. H. Chan to, to come and respond to that talk, then. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd really like to thank uh, Steve and Nancy for inviting me to this uh, lecture, and in particular to respond uh, to uh, Professor Petito's uh, enlightening and rich uh, lecture and sharing of her findings. Uh, every time I come back to this campus, um, it brings me back the fond memories of working with my colleagues uh, together. And in particular this time, um, it also helped me to take the MTR for the first time to come <laughs> to this university. With a, if I have this opportunity, most probably, uh, you know, I stay at my office and then uh, uh, maybe it take longer time before I can try this and experience this. And luckily, I find my little photo um, in one of uh, those big pictures along the corridor. <laughs> so, so this is really, really nice. 
And um, uh, back to this lecture, again, you know, Professor Petito, really, really thank you for the enlightening and rich uh, uh, presentation and findings. And um, uh, I must say that as a policymaker, um, you know, uh, since 1998, um, I really uh, appreciate uh, my previous experience in research because uh, policy making really needs research and evidence base to inform, although there are many, many, many other perspectives uh, which are necessary. And in terms of the relevance of this um, lecture in particular, um, the research uh, or the neuroscience on language development has actually significant impact on our policy making in language education during the last 10 years or so. And we, we did learn that um, instead of uh, uh, moving from one language to the other, uh, we, we now have uh, full findings on the bilingual language development of our children in, our early age, uh, in, in the early stage, in the early age. And uh, in Hong Kong, since 1997, we have this biliterate and trilingual language policy as a, a broad policy. At that time, um, we are not quite sure. We're not quite sure. We still move from a, a what we call the, the mother tongue um, to a bilingual, or maybe uh, uh, there's a, a, a fine division between the English as a medium of instruction and also Chinese as a medium of instruction. And uh, now we, we have actually moved on. Uh, last year, um, in our committee, or standing committee on language education and research, where Steve was a member, uh, is still a, is still a member, and uh, Amy have taken uh, taken part uh, very actively, and contributing a lot to a lot of advice to us, and uh, we we actually have taken up uh, emphasizing bilingual language uh, uh, development in early years. This is in one of our strict, uh, six strategic directions in our policy paper. And of course, the, also the, the paper to the legical, our, our legislators, you know, the, the big panel. And it has become our implementation you know, strategies. And uh, we, we're very lucky that we, we are going to set up a support team on learning both Chinese and languages at the same time in kindergarten. This is going to be a, a, a development uh, or developmental project. We hope that we have built in good research. We try, we, we try to and see how it would take place or how it is con contextualized in Hong Kong. All right, this is, it shows the, the importance you know, of research on really policy making. I'm sure a lot, a lot more children and students in Hong Kong will benefit from this. Although I know that, I know that uh, many kindergarten in schools have already introduced, you know, this biliterate uh, language policy. Actually, a recent question or concern to us is whether Putonghua, because in Chinese language we have the Cantonese, that is the the, 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 the language spoken by most people in Hong Kong, whereas Putonghua is the national language. Putonghua is actually a compulsory you know, curriculum for our primary and secondary schools. So knowing or learning from the, from the research, it seems that uh, we are, well, by default or in one way or another, we are on the right track, all right? We're, we're not against it. Uh, but to learning from our research, there are a couple of questions that we would like to learn more from you. Uh, firstly, I, I really appreciate that uh, you mentioned the, the time on task. Because, uh, well, uh, I, I work here as um, a teacher in curriculum studies before. So, so we, 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 we are actually interested. We'd like to know more from the very micro to the, to the macro. And um, what is the optimal? time on task in terms of pedagogy, maybe at different stages, maybe in kindergarten, in the primary schools, and secondary schools, when two languages are being uh, employed. So this is the first question. The second question, is, uh, actually, I'm really happy that you mentioned that, or the findings show that community home uh, school environment 
or particularly cultures, the culture from home and the community can compensate or somehow make up for, for, um, for, for something, all right, in the classroom. So in your study, what variables have you used to show that the community and the home actually are also working on language development? And then thirdly, uh, as, a language, uh, as a teacher educator before, because eventually we need teachers to deliver in schools and we need teachers to work with parents. So what are the implications of the findings for teacher education? So these are the questions I'd like to, really like to know, uh, know more from the findings of uh, Professor Petito and of course from, from our dear fellows, uh, colleagues and the audience. Thank you very much. So, Lauren, could I invite you yes. perhaps to first to, yes. to say a little bit in response to KK's questions? Thank you so much. Those questions were intriguing, wonderful, I'm uh, very thought-provoking. Um, <coughs> the first question was about the optimal time on task and what w for early bilingual exposure. Yes. And um, um, one of the things we're finding is that there is no magic percentage, so it's, it, 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 there's no magic number, so it's not, and it's certainly not ours. Um, uh, but we see that uh, when we compare children who are sequentially exposed to language, to language, multiple languages versus um, uh, simultaneous within the same developmental period, that's optimal. And then on closer scrutiny, um, it's usually, it, the, we compared 50-50 programs in the United States, which um, have uh, roughly half the day in Spanish and half the day in English. And we compared them to uh, what's called 90-10 schools, where most of the day is in um, English. And then as the child gets strong in English, uh, the uh, percentage of English is then decreased. Uh, where they let the Spanish rise. And that takes three years. It's by first grade to third grade. And um, uh, the critical feature is that children need to have systematic exposure um, roughly 50 50. Mm -hmm. And it, they're not sensitive to uh, absolute mathematical terms of number of hours. And I just would like to uh, say a, a moment about why. Um, uh, the child needs to have the experience with very systematic patterns within a particular age because the uh, maturation of that brain tissue is evolving uh, within a set time. So we have this thing we call language. It has, we, it has a big L, but it has many parts, phonology, morphology, syntax, and uh, um, um, uh, semantics, etc., and um, there are different brain tissue that's associated with each part, and the phonological brain tissue is maturing on a quite unforgiving timetable. So that comes online at five months gestation, it peaks at age three, it wanes by around seven to eight, and it stabilizes by about ten years old. And so the child needs the experience early, but it's not looking for amount. And that's very, um, so it needs the experience, the encounter with the systematicity to trigger the system. But it's not looking for, I need three hours of um, Mandarin and, and, but six hours of Cantonese. So that's the first, we, we know that, uh, and we have many examples of that. So children who have impoverished language input um, as long as they had experience with language within the right developmental timetable, they will achieve the milestone. So there, and there's cultures that have very extreme uh, reduced input. And yet the children, as long as they heard language, ex had language experience within that time frame, it will initiate the development. And, um, and it actually makes sense. The species isn't dependent on 
the number or frequency. Uh, we can go beyond the input. We can use morsels and expand. Um, we see this even in children's errors in language acquisition where they go beyond the input and over-regularize and make grammatical errors because they're not um, uh, wholly dependent on the input. They're hearing morsels of what we give them and then systematizing it, going beyond and generating more. So with regard to optimal time on task, roughly 50-50. Uh, beyond that, when the and within an early period and the right developmental period, but the number of hours is not, will not make or break the success of the child. Um, uh, the uh, brief, the second one is, because I want the audience yeah. to ask lots <laughs> of questions. Um, the, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the variables uh, that were important? Uh, well, how did we measure? Uh, the impact of the uh, child's success uh, with cultural variables uh, as compared to, uh, just make sure I understand that. Um, Second and the community. Home and community as opposed to school. Yes, so um, there was um, home, community, and instructional. Those are the different types of ways the child, uh, the different groups of children were exposed to this new language. And um, these were large groups of children who were coming from another country, who were entering um, either Quebec society, uh, where it's predominantly French, and um, with regard to the law, it's French. Um, and then we compared uh, um, native children who were coming up through the French school system, who were then, for the first time in grade four, allowed to be exposed to English, uh, uh, highly instructional, and we looked at the families that moved to Quebec uh, based um, and their, the extent to which they interacted with the community and did not. And that led to the observation that the children who were exposed to the new language for the first time in instructional context and older in their schooling performed less well than the children who even came from another country, had no support at home, but immediately went into a complete immersive immersion environment where um, their community supported the language and we tracked their development and it was, they were successful compared to the children who only had instruction only and then we uh, examined the children who ex experienced um, early exposure to the multiple languages from the home. So these were uh, tracked and filmed and um, uh, coded and uh, the features were of, of their environments were uh, strongly taken into consideration. I should say we looked at how long it took the children to get into the target language. So um, if you're a native speaker and you're 25 years old, we examined the proportion of your nouns, your verbs, your full expressive uh, parts of uh, your target language. And then we looked at how long it took the child to gain entry into the target language basic grammar. Um, and how long it took if you had only home environment, uh, only home instruction, how long it took if you had home and community, how long it took to crack into the language if you had only instructional. And it took much longer for the children to achieve the stable grammatical knowledge that you would have as a, uh, in your basic grammar. Uh, time into language acquisition was much longer for the children with instruction only. And time into language acquisition was much more compressed for the children who were exposed to uh, two languages, three languages uh, from home and community. So, uh, now, uh, teachers, that's a quick answer. Um, teachers, uh, how to uh, work with parents, uh, the implications for these fine, uh, this knowledge uh, with um, teachers who are then going to turn and teach children. Is that, was that? Um, that one is exciting. It's to change our teacher curriculum for teaching teachers. Uh, have it incorporate 
uh, research that uh, to participate, have teachers participating in it, be uh, expert in the uh, in interpreting the research in. Um, reading the research and knowing what's bad research and what's good research and being um, really expert consumers of all the things that they're told to, 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 to get to the point where they can smell what is good science and um, uh, weaker science and to make policies and changes that are informed from multiple sources, both behavioral, uh, their own experiences in the classroom, what education has taught us about educating young children, and the neuroscience, a combination. And we actually did that at Dartmouth College in the United States. Um, Professor Dunbar and I um, uh, revamped the teacher education training curriculum for the state of New Hampshire and um, incorporated all those factors I just mentioned into their basic training so that they were outstanding consumers of knowledge and could evaluate the knowledge. Okay, well thank you. Now we have many, many teachers and parents here in the audience. I'm sure there are lots of questions. So could I invite one or two questions? Yes. Professor Petito, uh, this is Sam Chu from Hong Kong U. Um, I, I'd like to say that uh, your talk is very important for parents and the grandparents here. <laughs> when my daughter was very young, my wife and I uh, provide a trilingual environment for her. So English, Putonghua, and uh, Cantonese. And uh, some of our friends at that time think we were crazy. <laughs> but uh, as you said, providing your, ch your children um, a multilingual uh, environment early helps them. And so by age five, my daughter was able to speak as well as a native, uh, any native English speaker, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 in English. And then the, she's also um, uh, good at uh, uh, Cantonese and also uh, pretty good at uh, um, uh, Putonghua. Um, and then because uh, she's so flexible with her tongue, and so in junior secondary school, she also picked up Japanese and also French. And then by age 15, uh, year 11, so equivalent to Form 5 in Hong Kong curriculum, uh, she's excellent in English, actually one of the best in her class in English. And then she's also good at French and Cantonese and uh, okay with her uh, Putonghua. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. I just want to briefly say that there is, that's the measure that I was talking about, how long it takes the child to get into the native language and to ha show um, uh, basic competence in the grammar. And those are measures that we actually use in the field. Um, I was thrilled with your comments. Uh, thank you so much for offering them. Uh, you, uh, um, I don't think I have to do any more research because <laughs> you've done it all. Um, uh, it took us like, several decades to find the same thing. Um, uh, and, uh, and a lot of US money and Canadian federal funding. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is why. Um, we've done the studies and we've seen that uh, the early exposure to the multiple language sets up neural roots and pr gives the child neural savings that keep open longer their capacity to make uh, discriminations in non-native languages. And so you actually gave your child a gift. It was an incredible gift. Those neural pathways stay open and gives them, makes possible, that's the mechanism that makes possible your daughter's capacity to uh, learn Japanese and French uh, and, and so on. You're, you're, th these are uh, biological gifts we give our children. You're actually changing your child's brain. Uh, and making sure the neural pathways that discriminate sounds stay open and um, are able to be um, uh, reinitiated, reengaged later in life when they get exposure to other languages outside of their original set. So, as I said, um, that's basically the research. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say that I wish you were here 10, 15 years ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I this question first? Yes. Sorry, it may take me a second to play around with this question. It's for Professor uh, Chan, uh, but obviously I'd love to hear all of your views on it. Thank you very much for a great lecture as well, by the way. 
Um, it's just in, in relation to, you mentioned the policy of um, early exposure with the kindergarten approach. Um, but in, in a, a number of cases in Hong Kong, and I'm not saying in every household, you would have a monolingual family background, perhaps obviously increasing proficiency we've seen obviously with English, um, obviously complicated by Pu Tong as as well. Um, but it's going back to pr Professor Petito's um, point on equality. Um, let's just say they're in the kindergarten. Um, they've been delivered the dual language approach. Uh, when they go home, obviously, the main ex exposure may, by preference, you know, and familiarity, the one language. Would that negate some of the, the effectiveness of the kindergarten policy? Um, maybe they are going to shut down and not listen to the Cantonese at home if that's the predominant language, or maybe they're going to favor the English if that's a predominant language, or if policy is going the way it's going, Putonghua, for example. I just worry if you do not, um, in conjunction with kindergarten policy, put with something to deal and support parents, in light of what uh, Professor Petito said about um, having community, instructional, home and all of these in intertwined, uh, are we setting ourselves up for a fall? I mean, I've witnessed it in a number of secondary schools. Um, when it's purely instructional, um, when they go home, they've got one language. I know this is a huge question. It's just a, a passion area. Um, when their friends are all speaking the one language, they will stay in that language that their friends are in, despite early exposure and the excellent work of the Hong Kong system. One language will predominate, and they'll become worse than the other one. I know it's not brain related, it's behavioral. I, I'm just wanting to get your comments on that. I know that's a huge question, I apologize. Um, uh, you said it yourself, uh, it's not a brain issue. The children, um, as, and I said it, I also mentioned, children will absolutely uh, establish language uh, preferences and language uh, dominance, but these are sociolinguistic factors that aren't uh, at the core of a biological capacity. Um, and that's why I was saying we need to have programs that when we present the language to the children are equal and uh, have equal status and um, equal respect. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the children need to see all these languages um, as um, uh, vibrant, exciting ways in which we communicate in the world, and um, fascination with the cultures and groups, and uh, we can, as teachers, set up context to facilitate that. Um, uh, because it, what's exciting for me is that it's not a biological wall we're reaching. We're not reaching a biological ceiling that we can change this, and children are changeable in that way. Good afternoon. Thank you for the uh, presentation. I'm a parent with uh, children ranging from 6 to 12. Um, thank you for confirming the benefit of uh, bilingual education. Uh, and in a way, it reaffirms Hong Kong's policy of bilateral bi and trilingual. But uh, many uh, observers, at least when we were promoting the bilateral trilingual policy, they were kind of quoting the people saying that uh, bilingualism is only for the elite or for the more talented people. They quote people like uh, Co uh, Dr. Ko Hing Sui, uh, former minister of education and later on the deputy prime minister of Singapore, saying that only about 25%, uh, meaning the better students, uh, can really master bilingualism. Um, so I know that uh, your study focused on the science of learning. But uh, have you done a study whether bilingualism or multilingualism uh, would lead to a deterioration in the standard of language? Many people said that the language standard in Hong Kong, uh, particularly in English, has deteriorated. Um, so that's question number one. Number two is you uh, talk about bilingualism. But, but in Hong Kong, most families are actually the, uh, f uh, kind of uh, multilingual. Uh, multilingual is, uh, Cantonese, Putonghua, and English, and then for those that have uh, domestic helpers, uh, then they would have uh, exposure to Tagalog or Indonesian. 
Uh, have you done a study on what is the maximum number of language can, that a kid can be exposed to before some harm would happen? Thank you. Thank you for your very thought-provoking uh, comments and questions. Um, I'm intrigued by the uh, notion that uh, bilingualism or multilingualism is only for a discrete elite. Um, uh, I see it as a component of humanity. Uh, it, it, what we see in children is they don't uh, know our groups yet. And if you give it to them early, they drink it in and um, see that other child uh, with um, equal eyes. It, it, so, um, uh, but you, you, you had another comment about in your first question uh, whether there is um, evidence of uh, deterioration or contamination of the languages. Um, now, we don't see that. Um, we tested the hypothesis that uh, multiple language exposure leads to uh, contamination. And um, instead, with early exposure, uh, we certainly uh, don't see that. But there's another notion. Uh, this has to do with language maintenance. If the child's exposed to multiple languages, let's say uh, early at home and then early in the school, and then you stop the child's experience with one of those languages, you definitely will see deterioration. Absolutely. Languages need to be maintained. They're living. Uh, the brain tissue is living that's uh, processing them. So young children will lose a family language or a community language if it's not maintained. That we know. Um, your second question about how many, what's the upper limit? We only studied up to five. <laughs> and the child was, these children were um, with stable input and uh, predictable users, uh, absolutely uh, outstanding. No, no problem at all. More than that, I don't know. If, um, you might have the experiment in nature here. Thank you. Just one. Yes. President Petito, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for your reassuring uh, presentation. I said reassuring because I also have a good fortune of having a trilingual grandson. Uh, the situation is different from my friend from Hong Kong U. Uh, my son-in-law is Korean and they live in London. So um, it, at home, uh, they have uh, the Cantonese hours and the Korean hours. Now, a little uh, sensitivity is called for because when the father speaks and, and the nanny, who is also Korean, speaks to him in Korean for an hour or two, my wife and I and my daughter will sneak out of the room and give it a full Korean language milieu. <laughs> and then when we have dinner, we will turn to Cantonese and my respectable son-in-law will shut up. <laughs> and, and we do it in Cantonese only. And then we go out to the high park and we interact with British children. We will use English only. Now this is very intentional. And as a result, all the points you have presented in your PowerPoint is true to our family, to the child. The, the, the language milestone is exactly the same as the monolingual. Everything is, is perfectly matches with, with what you have, you have said. So I thank you for this. The only complicated matter, uh, which is my question now, is he is left-handed. Now, with left-handedness, uh, we, we, we hear it, uh, about things being a left-handed person being very developed in the right hemisphere. I don't know whether it's true, but whether you have some scientific backup on whether left-handedness is conducive or detrimental to second language learning or multilingualism. That's a question. Thank you. Amazing question. Um, uh, uh, at the moment, we have no evidence whatsoever that handedness impacts uh, or, or is uh, damaging to a child's uh, ultimate success in learning language. Uh, one of the things uh, we know is that, first of all, there's a very sm uh, proportionally small amount of people in the world who are left-handed, but of that, a fraction, infinitesimally small number of left-handers actually have switched laterality. So um, it's highly, highly, like the greatest frequency of left-handers have the identical brain laterality that you and I have. 
Um, you also could see, you can um, give him a complex math problem and see which way he looks. <laughs> and that will tell you his laterality. He's probably left hemisphere lateralized, like, like most of the world. So the incidence of a left-handers having a totally switched brain is very, 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 very small. <laughs> I'll give you a math problem later and see which way you look. Thank you very much. Let's just uh, take one more question before we finish. Yes, just lady at the front. Yes, uh, Professor Petito, it's been a very enlightening um, lecture. And actually, as a parent, I I'd also like to ask you if you could share some of your key findings in the science of learning in maths. <laughs> in maths. Um, uh, you mean generally how, yeah. uh, well, we certainly know, this is, there's wonderful work by Daniel Ansari and um, uh, Danislas, Stanislas Dehane. They look at the maturation of the neural tissue that makes possible our ability to uh, perform mathematical reasoning. Um, one of the exciting things from the science of learning is that um, uh, there there's a period when the neural tissue for maths gets uh, rerouted and uh, incorporates aspects of our language hemisphere, uh, particularly the superior temporal gyrus, so the segment segmentation abilities. So there's a mutual system between the segment segmentation we do in language and the segmentation uh, we do and the manipulation we do in math, and that they're mutually strengthening. So uh, superior math uh, ex um, uh, is related to um, ability to uh, phonologically segment the stream. Uh, it's also uh, related to um, uh, um, bilingual children. Um, there's uh, large groups of people who've analyzed uh, bilingual children and uh, found that they're advantaged in math as compared to monolingual children. Uh, so uh, the science of learning is showing us that bilingualism, language processing, and math are neurally, become neurally integrated systems that mutually are beneficial to one another. Well, thank you very much. I mean, the, the huge number of hands that have gone up show how much this talk has engaged your interest and attention. It's exciting to see how, how your own stories provided further evidence to confirm the research that Professor Petito has carried out. Um, I, I'd like to ask you all to thank both Professor Petito and Dr. Chan again for a wonderful <laughs> afternoon. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you, thank you for all of you. You will find as you go out tea and refreshment, so please do stay and have a cup of tea and continue to chat about this talk. We will have more talks in this series in the coming months, so please do look out for announcements of those and we look forward to welcoming you back in due course. Thank you very much for coming today. Okay.